you could make a case that we're, we're in the midst of a meaning crisis. And, and then that really that meaning crisis has happened because the two pillars that we used to lean on, which was, you know, we could sort of nominally say meaning 1.0 being traditional religion, organized faith structures, uh, and meaning 2.0, sort of the, the enlightenment experiment, modern liberalism, that both of them are getting a little long in the teeth. And in that vacuum of the sort of the roof caving in of a shared consensus, we're sort of seeing people getting sucked to the extremes of sort of fundamentalism on one side and nihilism on the other. Like none of this matters, none, there is no there there. The time for singular tops down solutions is probably done. That's part of the balkanization. Um, but can we create a toolkit by which people can build effective, durable, um, functional structures um, in a decentralized way? And, and in a way that's not balkanization, just a thousand tiny uh, factions warring at each other, but maybe something that sort of shares an operating system like Linux or blockchain um, that actually is functional and then supports collaboration, cross-pollination, and then hopefully, a, you know, a, a million micro experiments of which a, you know, a thousand, ten thousand, and whatever will, will catch and that we can then cotton on to those and that we can use those as ways to kind of rebuild what's next for, you know, to face kind of future complexity and challenge. And the Sacred Design Lab at Harvard Divinity School actually, you know, articulated this. There were the three things they said are really helpful beyond meaning some sense of awe, some sense of the sublime or the ineffable, becoming some sense of growth and healing and belonging, right? Some form of community. We are social primates. And so the intention is to say, um, what, how have we done it in the past? And let's look back through the historical and anthropological record of how have <clears throat> different mystery cults or traditions, how have different, different communities of practice created vibrant and resilient communities over time? Because religion wouldn't have persisted if it wasn't a, an effective meme. I mean, back to Richard Dawkins 101, right? I mean, it would have snuffed itself out if it was, mal if it was a maladaptive social strategy. So we, you know, just objectively, you're like, okay, something's working there. What is it? And it's probably not the just so stories. It's probably not the mythologies, right? So the intention with neuroanthropology is look back in the past, see what patterns we can find in, in the historical record. But, you know, and this is a new development. Now we also have the understandings from neuroscience, evolutionary biology, some of more of the harder sciences to say, well, what was actually going on under the hood? Why did that, why did those things work? Why did they persist? And if we can combine those two, Right? We can then sort of engage the project of culture architecture, which is now looking forwards, not backwards, and saying, now here are the Lego blocks. Here's how they snap together. Here's how they work. We're in a period of exponential change, but no one has articulated a framework for exponential meaning for us to help make sense of all this and steer it. And that's that, you know, E.O. Wilson, the Harvard biologist's, you know, pithy summation where he says we have, you know, we have paleolithic emotions. Basically, our neurophysiology and even root psychology is 50,000 years old, out of date. <laughs> you know, we've got medieval institutions and we've got godlike technology. And how to make sense of all that, um, I think probably would have overtaxed you know, both religion and modern liberalism, even at their even at their full strength, healthiest versions. But we're now in a period of decline, decay and collapse. And how do we instantiate different ways of tracking the all the exponential rates of change and consequence? You know, in some respects, this is all futile. You know, this is all just pissing in the wind, right? We're, we're all just doing our level best to take a little stand on some piece of this shifting map and say, I think this might help, you know, and our, and our, and our friends and colleagues at the Consilience Project, Daniel Schmachtenberger, Zach Stein, and others that have had time, you know, uh, on the Rebel Wisdom platform, you know, they're looking to try and address the information ecology. And they're trying to sort of say, hey, we're in a, we're in, you know, and, and Daniel's done great stuff with the War on Sense Making series and that kind of thing, which is just, we are in the shit or go blind state. Let's come up with more trustworthy information. 
what you know my particular piece of this was to say i think it's actually at the level of both deeply personal and transcendent so if, if consilience is kind of operating here in the sort of rational evidence-based meaning making my my assumption is also it's the mythopoetics it's the grand stories of where have we come from what's going on and where do we go from here and, and, and in that vacuum, right, we've seen everything from anti-vax conspiracies to QAnon. We're, we're, we're seeing, you know, nature abhors a vacuum and so does culture. And so we're seeing that. And then there's also this, in, you know, as a result of the meaning crisis, it's not just abstract, right? We all experience the rudderlessness. We experience the schizophrenic confusion and we're succumbing to diseases of despair. We're succumbing to individual and collective traumas you know, micro and macro PTSD. So for me, it's kind of a pillar to post play, which is if we can help humans, you know, individually and, and at scale, um, reclaim their inspiration. So I, I kind of remember what I forgot. I, I, re, I reaffirm my reason for being, you know, in this wacky ass existential experience of being alive on this earth briefly kind of Ernest Becker, you know, that kind of existential dilemma. Um, and at the same time, discharge trauma and, and, and ideally come from as integrated and resourceful a place as possible and reaffirm connection to others, starting with, you know, pairs, starting with life partners, expanding slowly to small groups and slightly larger groups. Is that possibly a way for us to live into and animate stories that serve us and that serve us, you know, collectively um, through, you know, potentially periods of accelerating and, and novel and consequential change. Daniel Schmachtenberger first kind of shared this frame with me four or five years ago, but that idea that, hey, things are getting exponentially better. And that's the Steven Pinker, Matt Ridley's of the world, the, the Hans Roslings. You know, if you've ever seen the TED Talks of like all the good things and poverty is decreasing and diseases are going down and literacy is up and war is down. And, and, and hey, you know, there's this sort of underreported uptick in, you know, the, the benefits of the Enlightenment experiment. You can go, whew, boy, I thought, you know, that's a that's great news. <laughs> you know, I thought that, I thought we were fucked. Um, but then sort of, you know, undeniably, things are also getting exponentially worse. And, they're, and these, both of these things are happening. And typically people can't hold that. So we just glom onto the one that resonates with us most. You know, if, if I am prone to doom and gloom, despair and cynicism, I'm going to latch on to Extinction Rebellion. Or if you're prone to either neuroticism or optimism, you're gonna be extra biased to pick up the good news and cling to it. But I think the, the you know, the fairly, obvious answer is they're both happening. And when you're trying to map the ultimate linear outcome to the intersection of two exponential curves, it's crazy making. And so what we're seeing is a, um, I don't know if it's a revival. I, I, my hunch is, is that we're seeing an increase. I mean, I think this is a, it's a deep structure, but we're seeing an increase in rapture ideologies. And, you know, most of us, when we hear that term, we will, we would think of, you know, sandwich boards, you know, the end is nigh, you know, ringing the bell kind of thing or, or, or wired up to suicide vests, you know, that sort of thing. So sort of fundamentalist, traditional, religious end times stories. And for sure, we are seeing plenty of those. You know, and ISIS has a whole story. So we're familiar with those ones. But once you see that there's actually a structure underneath it, which is the world as we know it, the secular, mundane, 3D world is fucked. There is no way out of this. But there's an inflection point coming in the near future, and we can kind of see it from here. Um, and our people come up roses on the other side of that inflection point. Therefore, let's go as fast as we can towards it. Let's get there as soon as possible. And never mind the collateral damage, because we are leaving this reality, this complexity, this problem set behind. As soon as you see that, then you're like, oh, wow, how, how similar this is to techno-utopian raptures. 
And whether that's Ray Kurzweil and hey, you know, ecological systemic collapse, not, not moral decay, not something like that, but like, you know, carrying capacity of the planet is going, you, you know, in 2030 or 2040, we're going to be able to upload our consciousness to computers. Those folks who are whatever, bi-coastal Silicon Valley, you know, billionaires pay to play, take your pick of what that 1% is. It's not the elect or saved of a faith, but it might be those with meritocratic or economic privilege will be able to upload our consciousness and then we're going to transmigrate to something else. So never mind 3D and, you know, all of us will then be free to play in the silicon chip multiverse. You're like, oh, surprisingly similar, <laughs> right? And even the same with, you know, the current space race, the idea of space colonies and Mars and other things, which is once again, you know, and Stephen Hawking <laughs> has said this, Elon Musk has said this, others have said, look, um, we've got less than a century. And if we don't build a, you know, a transplanetary um, capacity, we're stuffed. And most people hear that and they're like, wow, you know, this, that's our Iron Man super geniuses, or this is our, you know, physics guy, you know, super smart. And everyone's like, yay, you know, Star Trek, it's finally here. But then you think about it and you're like, hmm, you know, there's just not going to be that many tickets to ride. And the, the conclusion that this planet is going to collapse and we can't support 8 billion people. And that's gonna go badly pear-shaped. Therefore, instead of fixing it, we're already writing it off. And we're actually gonna create escape hatches that is structurally indistinguishable, right? Our belief systems, our philosophies or theologies kind of sort of matter less than the root structures because what it ends up doing is it, you know, it basically condemns 7.5, 7.9, you know, billion people to bitter ends. And, you know, John Gray at the London School of Economics wrote a book called Black Mass and the Death of Utopias. And he wrote it in 2008, I think, but it was, he, so he was prompted by <clears throat> the Bush, Cheney, Rumsfeld, neocons move into the Middle East, right? The sort of Iraq, Afghanistan stuff. And he actually, it blew my mind when I read it. I mean, it's, it's, it's straightforward once you say it, but I hadn't connected these dots, but he's like, look, that rapture ideology is ancient in the Western world. It goes back to original Judeo-Christian stuff, the Alpha and the Omega. You know, most belief systems, most cosmologies were somewhat cyclical or timeless. Like life is what life is. We engage in our rituals, our prayers, our ceremonies to keep this thing going, right? To perpetuate the cycle of balance. But the Judeo-Christian, you know, sort of whatever, uh, you know, intellectual innovation slash virus, depending on how you hold it, was there is a beginning in time, it starts, clock starts, and then there is an omega, that, that's the alpha, and then there's an omega, an end, and therefore in between is time's arrow. And the Judeo-Christian one is obviously the fall from Eden, right? Man is suffering, then there's going to be a redemption or a second coming and a happily ever after. And his point, which I think many scholars have made, which was that, you know, even things like socialism and communism, the 20th century utopian projects were identical in structure, just stripped of God. And once you see them, you can't unsee them. And the trick is, is you sort of, you realize pretty much everybody's peddling some version of this because collectively, even if we can't put our finger on it, we all know something's badly wrong. You know, the spidey senses are just on high alert. So anybody who says, hey, you're not crazy, things are badly wrong, you know, you've got everyone's undivided attention. But then almost inevitably, everybody is peddling some version of, hey, psst, but if you're on the inside of this, we have a way out and we don't actually have to solve this impossible multivariable problem, which is freaking us all out. We can all just skip it and get to an outcome where we bypass the human condition and our collective responsibility for how we got here, but also our collective obligation for each other and for, you know, let's just say the bottom four billion, the people who may not have agency information or choice. Yeah, that comes from Kurt Vonnegut and, you know, who many people are probably familiar with, he was actually doing his graduate work at the University of Chicago in, in anthropology, funnily enough, and, and he came up with the, he's like, hey, I think actually that all of our stories just share a handful of shapes 
and you can Google this, on, you, can, you can check it out on YouTube, he's got some great little lectures on this, but he's like, look, there's basically, you know, the sort of down then up story, that sort of rags to riches, like you start out sucking and then happily ever after. There's the up then down then up again, you know, typically the kind of boy meets girl, you know, so meet cute, then they get that separated for stupid reasons and then they come back together and then and they live happily ever after. But he's like, actually the most compelling story, we, you know, ever, the one that really gets our rocks off is the Cinderella story which is, you know, down. So that's, you know, Cinderella, shitty stepsisters and lousy stepmother sweeping ashes and, and you know, and, and, and confined to the cellar. Then up, you know, um, bibbidi bobbidi boo and pumpkin coaches and dancing with the prince, strike of midnight, precipitous drop, right? Absolutely everything is lost. And then and only then, the greatest happily ever after ever. And so he said, that's the, that's the story we can't get enough of. And it's not just Cinderella. He's like, that's actually also the New Testament, you know, <laughs> which, is, <clears throat> which is funny because you're like, oh, you get the Old Testament, you get East of Eden, the fall from grace, you get the flood, you get Yahweh's just pissed off and sick of humans, <laughs> you know, and we are doomed to suffer and get bitten by snakes and toil on the land and pain of childbirth and the whole bit. But hey, great news, little star of Bethlehem. You know, and, and here comes salvation. Oops, terrible Good Friday. You know, passion of the Christ, oh, all is lost. And then roll back the stone, Easter Sunday. So just to know that our shapes of stories are so profoundly entrenched in Western art, literature, song, mythologies, theologies, that we almost, unless we're aware of them, we just go along with them and they just feel truthy. And the questions here is, is what narratives can work for us that steer us in a, dis, in a direction that doesn't lead to basically sociopathic denial of our collective responsibility for each other and for this home planet of ours. And so there's a massive level of this stack, which is all the practical stuff, all the hard decisions, all the, <clears throat> all the, politics, the social organizing, the, the ecological you know, policies, economic, I don't know. There's a, th there's a million levels to this that I have no concept of. But what I do believe is that is some root hope in human nature if we can get out of our own way. And so if we can, again, reconnect to healing and inspiration, and reconnect in higher trust, compassionate connection, that what we will choose to do from there um, can potentially have exponential positive impact. And more to the point, it's the kind of sine qua non, right? Like without those things, we're stuffed. If people are traumatized and reactive, if we have forgotten any sense of any higher or nobler reason for being other than just red in tooth and claw, dog eat dog survival, and if we break any sense of connectivity for our fellow humanity, then none of this can possibly happen. It's funny and it's tricky to discuss that sort of alchemist cookbook idea because, um, you know, sex, drugs, rock and roll, <laughs> breathing music, you know, all those things, they are highly taboo. There's almost no one who has neutral opinions around what those mean, what they look like in combination or independently. And in the writing of it, I realized, oh, we all come with some lens or some sort of persona as to how we relate to access to peak states and healing, and especially through potent tools. And rather than steering away from that, you know, because they're taboo, I think that the fact that they're taboo is actually, that, that's, a, that's a clue. Because you're like, oh, of course, any civilization or culture worth its salt had to try and rein in the strongest evolutionary impulses we had, otherwise nothing would get done. So sexual taboos, right? Massively, ma you know, consistent across the world. There's definitely ways we do it and ways we don't. <laughs> and you will be punished or, or celebrated depending on which side of that you go. The same with intoxication. There are state sanctioned states of consciousness and there are ones that are vilified and repressed depending on what frequency of awareness we mandate, endorse, and support. 
And whether that's Moses coming down from the mountaintop and finding his wild ass dreadlocked Hebrew tribe, you know, off their faces, worshiping a golden calf, you know, <laughs> hammered and fornicating. And he's like, no, 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 thou shalt, thou shalt, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, right? And, and, and encoding the baselines of that, Hammurabi's code, the Mormons in the 19th century, right? No drinking, no fornicating, no thinking. You got ditches to dig and irrigation to build, right? We got work to do, people. And studiousness means sobriety and celibacy, right with you know outside of very controlled places so once we realize that we're like oh you know basically we're sort of loosely fall into one of three buckets you know we, we either orient as hedonists you know, like give me all the experience possible right the more the merrier i want to suck the marrow out of life you know and, and, and die young leave a good looking corpse or a purist which is the sort of my body is my temple and any of these more lively volatile or potent techniques are suspect they're either shortcuts, they're cheating, they're immoral, they could be any of those kind of things. I engage in meditation, yoga, prayer, whatever it would be. These are the approved and sanctioned ones. Or a conformist, right? Which is, I actually don't assess these things clearly myself. I defer to medical, legal, or religious authority. And what they tell me is what's okay. And that obviously ends up with screwy things like, I have no problem knocking back four whiskeys and maybe even smoking a cigarette, having my kid on an amphetamine so they can sit still, having, you know, going to sleep with Ambien, you know, and having my spouse on Prozac, even though it's completely killed our sex life. That's all okay, you know, but passing around a joint at a party or engaging in, M in MDMA couples therapy in lieu of getting a divorce, right, or any of those things, that's off the res and no way in hell. So the idea here is to say, well, each of those is obviously partial and limited, right? They, 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 they aren't fully expressed responsibilities, but they all have a value that's important. So the hedonist is like, hey, I really value sucking the marrow out of life. I value the fullest range of experience possible. And the purist says, well, I really value the sanctity of mind and body. Awesome. And the conformist will often say, I value the evidence and advice of experts. So you're like, great. Now, what if we distilled those three? Could we become hedonic engineers that honor all three of those things? And then if we do, we're like, hey, we're humans, you know, we're monkeys with clothes. And here's how we work. We breathe, we fuck, you know, we, we have bodies, we have these meat suits, we actually respond powerfully to entraining and coherence with music, and we actually benefit from shifting states. And if we can integrate those things, can we actually use them in a pro-social way to accelerate our integration and our resourcefulness, and then ultimately our impact. So that's really the kind of, that's the, the baseline of the alchemist's cookbook. And it's just to say, hey, this is just, this is literally just a sort of a user manual for being human. And here's how our bodies and brains work. And oh, by the way, when you learn to use them skillfully, and this is, you know, many steps beyond kind of biohacking, which is almost always commercial. You know, like here's a gadget or here's a pill and do this thing. None of it gets, none of it resolves the human condition at all. <laughs> you know, they're just, they're just distractions and diversions. But, you know, to actually say, here's the full stack user manual for doing this human thing. And it doesn't actually premise or promise a happily ever after steady state, you know, back to it, you know, we got to avoid the lure of those rapture ideology that just says, look, healing, inspiration, connection, or, or, or catharsis, like the wounding and release of it, ecstasis, the peak experience, and communitas, a profound sense of connection, right? That's kind of the flywheel of this life of ours. We're forever finding it, forgetting it, getting the shit kicked out of us, picking ourselves up, you know, leaning on our friends or, or helping someone else out, doing it again, doing it again. Like this is the human experience. And so if we just get better at that flywheel, to me, it's like the difference between like Tai Chi and Aikido. You know, like I, I studied Tai Chi for a while and it was like, and it was actually a very rad version. It was from, it was from Taiwan. So it was actually quite martial and combative. It wasn't sort of like librarian squishy shit, but it was all based on the premise of never lose your balance. Like if you fall over, it's because you lost your root, right? Where Aikido does the exact opposite. It's like, you're going to fall. So get really, really good at falling. 
In fact, practice falling so much that in fact falling, thro being thrown through the air backwards, is actually you're still centered. And it's no different than if you were standing. And, you know, Bruce Lee famously said, he said, we don't ever fight from form. You don't sort of like get jumped in a bar fight and like, okay, have at me. <laughs> you know, you get cold cocked with a bottle when you weren't looking. He said, we, we don't fight from form. We fight to form. Like life happens and then we do our level best to get back to an integrated ergonomic response. And so that's what, you know, this alchemist cookbook can do. It's sort of nothing more than nothing less than, you know, access to God consciousness, access to profound defragging of our nervous systems and potentially the most meaningful relationships we could have. And that doesn't get us off the hook. All that does is just get us a chance to kind of keep on keeping on. These are neurophysiological protocols. You can skin them however you want. You can add whatever layer of cultural or personal meaning to them that you want. But if, you know, once you conduct those experiments and specifically just to kind of give context, you know, the use of respiration, sexuality, embodiment, music and substances. I mean, just they are, you know, there are there others? Absolutely. Uh, these are five of the most prominent and dominant. And if you look back, back to the neuroanthropology, if you look back through three, four, five hundred thousand years of human experience, they're almost always in the mix in some, in some combinations. If you actually combine them and stack them into a you know, series of deliberate practices, they typically disclose very information rich states or experiences. And they're often quite salient, you know, meaning that they are, they feel very relevant and real. And they're often um, quite profound in their personal significance or meaning. So the neat thing about that, and the reason we would maybe call this a meta toolkit is just that you sort of like believe what you want to believe, right? Here's the protocols to go, you know, whether, whether it's meet your maker, connect to self, connect to source, you know, discharge your grief, whatever it would be, like, go do that. And, and because we now have reliable evidence-based feedback on what that is, how to get there, how to come and go from those places, we can actually reverse millennia of religiosity and storytelling. So it's like, instead of, cause it used to be that, you know, a singular person, a standout human, either by luck or skill or grace, got to someplace amazing. They came back with their epiphany and they said, hey, you'll never believe what I've just seen, right? And everyone's like, well, truly we won't because we can't get there ourselves. What tell us, right? You saw that thing on the mountain. I've come down with my tablets, right? No one else was like Googling it or Lexus Nexusing and being like, well, I don't even, I, don't, I disagree with your translation. So, so we ended up fetishizing relatively random individual experiences of post-conventional insight. And now that we actually have the tools to open source it, to truly democratize transcendence, then you're like, never mind. Like, don't, don't, <laughs> if you think you've seen the whole nature of reality, you're probably haven't just, probably haven't gone back enough. And instead it's like, here's the protocol, go see for yourself. And now we can, we can completely invert basically religious mythology and it becomes experimental and experiential. And then everybody's truth is sovereign to them versus a hand-me-down shaggy dog story. I think the simplest is just to say, um, and actually our, our uh, buddy Brian Murarescu, who just wrote The Immortality Key, which was, it's a, it's a fascinating book and he did some rigorous research at the Vatican and elsewhere, but he basically makes a case called, you know, technically it's called the pagan continuity hypothesis. And he pulls out the Eleusinian mysteries from ancient Greece, which, you know, existed for a couple of thousands of years and inspired Pythagoras and Plato and Socrates and the whole gang, right? Most of Western civilization was, you know, lit up or, or amplified via the Eleusinian mysteries. And, it, and as many folks are aware these days, it quite likely had some psychedelic or psychoactive element to that death rebirth initiatory practice. And his big insight was, I think this continued into early Christianity, specifically first century Gnostics and that kind of thing before the church kind of got bureaucratized and kind of, you know, shut down into what Michael Pollan called placebo sacraments, right? The idea of like, we're going through the motions, but we're not getting the lightning bolt epiphanies. And, and you look through 
human history, you look through the anthropological literature and you realize, oh wow, like death, rebirth, initiatory practices are ubiquitous. They're ubiquitous in shamanic indigenous traditions, they're ubiquitous in the Hellenic and, and, and Judeo-Christian traditions, they kind of show up around the world. And consistently, they are identified, written about, referred to as overwhelmingly pivotal experiences. You know, Plato said, hey, the mysteries teach us not only how to die a better death, but how to live a better life. You know, Goethe said, he who does not know the secret die and become remains forever a stranger on this earth. And so in, in a simple sense, um, what is that, right? There, there are these profound, these, these sort of esoteric metaphor, metaphors about these death rebirth practices. What, what the hell is going on there? And we've actually, I think, kind of mapped it these days. And there is a very straightforward recipe and it includes co varying combinations. You can kind of mix and match depending on what's appropriate, relevant, desired for you of breathing, breath work, intensive breath work, um, embodiment, specifically tuning and calibrating core sort of metronomes in our system, whether, whether it's the endocannabinoid system, the vagal nerve system, the, the, the entire kind of system there. Um, heart rate, all these kind of things, our physiology, our fascia, our viscera, um, music and driving beats. And Daniel Levitin uh, at uh, McGill uh, University in Canada has made a case that actually music even predates spoken language. It's older, like we were making beats, we were making melody, we were communicating in call and response before we were even engaging in complex syntax and communication, which is mind bending. So you're like, oh, that's why it's so potent. Like that's why it kicks ass and we all love it so much substances, right? Oliver Sacks, the NYU neuroscientist famously said, he said, drugs are a shortcut. They promise transcendence on demand and, and they become identified and enculturated in pretty much every tradition around the world. Ron Siegel at UCLA has called our desire to get, but to seek intoxication or non-ordinary states is our fourth drive evolutionary drive beyond, you know, hunger, food, and sex, right? That, that we're actually, we're hardwired to seek it. And you realize, oh, we can actually um, create death rebirth experiences now, stripping out the mythologies, the stories around why and what and how many times you have to spin around and whose name you have to pray to or which, you know, how many chickens you have to cut the heads off. And we can actually just precipitate the experience. So you're like, oh, this is fascinating. And it's not substance dependent. So if people get fixated or titillated on sex, drugs, rock and roll, right? That's not the point. The point is actually the neurophysiological protocols. And you can get there through a lot of different doorways. And you can make the case that they have been, those are the, those are the levers that we've been playing with for all of human history to get to these places. They've just been cloaked in mythology, superstition, custom and accretion. So it, the, the, the protocols have become crazy complex, Byzantine and garbled and very hard to falsify. You had to believe 99 things that were garbage to engage the one thing that might actually be a, an effective evidence-based mechanism of action. So why does any of this matter? Right? Um, this to me, and not, now we're going to step out of um, technical, like kind of neuroscience and biology back to the kind of metaphorical, right? Which is um, this sense that um, we're all cosmic orphans, right? That sense of being born a human and simultaneously being a primate, an animal on this earth, the Ernest Becker conundrum, and at the same time being aware of past, present, future, and our ultimate mortality, demise, and insignificance is a son bitch, right? And none of us chose this. So firstborn, right? The first time we're born into this world, it is violent and it was not elective. I mean, unless you subscribe a priori to my soul journey or I chose my parents kind of thing, which you're welcome to, but like, you know, let's just set that aside. This was all accidental. This was just two humans fornicating that conceived us and we got spat out a womb into a bright, harsh, cold world that we didn't want. And many of us don't like the result, can't solve for the human condition. And we spend a shit pile of time trying to transcend or escape it. 
that's all personal growth, that's all new age, that's the, you know, all drug use, it's all these, I mean, I say all is too much, but it's, you know, there's an awful lot of it. And the possibility and power of, a, of being initiated into being twice born via a structured, you know, practical and repeatable death, rebirth, initiation gives us a choice for the first time in our lives to actually opt in. It's a profound sense of responsibility to acknowledge the cautions and a sense that the hour is late and back to, you know, Shulgin and Pikal and Tikal and sort of like, and I think this information needs to be articulated in a way that someone somewhere, some when, can dust it off and use it to reboot functional culture. And so the best model for me um, to think of, like, what are the perils and, and the con I mean, basically, this is the realm of all left-hand paths, east and west. You know, basically, the right-hand paths are the orthodox ones. You know, here's the rules, thou shouts and not shout nots. And the left-hand paths are typically like, it's all good. You know, like, make use of all the materials and everything is fodder for growth and transformation. And, you know, it, it, I think there's a Chinese saying that says, you know, the left-hand path is basically the fastest path to enlightenment with the lowest success rate. So to me, it's equivalent. Like, these, these tools, I mean, basically, it all ends up in kind of, you know, nerdy, n nerdy kink. You know, like, because if you, if you engage in, and access the sexuality and that kind of stuff, or, or super sexy biohacking. Like, if you just follow human optimization, neurophysiology, and how do we tick, you end up in those places. And you don't flinch. You're not squeamish. You'll clutch your pearls, right? You'll, you'll end up in those places. You're like, no, oh, okay, this is how it works. And oh, by the way, there's thousands of years of, you know, anthropological record about people working in these domains. But it's the equivalent of big wave surfing or, or alpine mountaineering. Right? It is highly consequential terrain. The falls can kill you, and you shouldn't venture into that, into that territory without humility, apprenticeship, equipment, partners. Right? And then when somebody inevitably dies, there's one of two things. Either they were unprepared and had no business in that terrain, or also what happens right? is they're actually masters of those domains. They just rolled snake eyes and Kali punched their ticket. And, and there's a very, dis and then there's different morality plays there, right? One is you had no business playing in that terrain. You shouldn't have been there. And that could be the guru with feet of clay. That could be the neophyte who's, you know, over their skis, right? Just wades in where, where angels fear to tread. Or it could be the Eddie Cows or the Alex Lowe's, right? The, the true, you know, watermen or mountain men or women um, who simply came unglued in the high stakes terrain that they had dedicated their lives to exploring. So, so to me, like, let's make no bones about it. This is, this is NC-17, fifth class rock climbing. It's not for kids and the falls can kill you. But that said, standing on top of a mountain at sunrise is one of the most gorgeous experiences you could have and bombing down, you know, bombing down turns afterwards is even better. So like, so there's the, the idea of like, how do we teach and train this in a way that's not unicorns and rainbows, that's not false promises of it's nothing but upside and no, no consequences, but actually teach it and train it the way we would teach extreme sports, which is with humility, respect and incremental progression. I think it's fair to say that like the only difference between an alchemist Right? Someone who is harnessing this, these techniques to realize some higher developmental project versus an addict, someone who's just lizard brain fuck monkey, just pushing the button again and again, you know, until they waste away, right, is the scoreboard. And, and, and in this case, the scoreboard is literally, you know, are you making a positive difference for yourself, for your family, for your community, for the world? Are you making art? And it doesn't have to be, you know, we don't, it's not all oil paintings, but are, are you literally, cre you know, like doing something uh, that is, that opposes the second law of thermodynamics, something <laughs> that leaves the world a little more good, true, or beautiful. So, so that sense of, ah, so these are the key, you know, the keys to our cage, right? The meaning crisis, 
and, and getting out and saying, oh, there is purpose, there is meaning, there is this mythopoetic grand story we can, I, I'm a part of and we're a part of and it might work out. Um, the keys to our cage are also the keys to the kingdom, right? They, they unlock the higher realms of the human experience that up till now have been confined to esoteric mystery traditions, etc. No, but that, that is a, that's a fearsome responsibility. And the only reason that we would be potentially sharing, you asked about kind of my sense of responsibility for this, the only reason we'd be sharing it is just the hour is late and the stakes are high. And I'm not aware of anything other than open sourcing that death, rebirth, initiation, open sourcing the possibility for choice for people to say, I'm all in for this planet, these bodies, this lifetime, like no Mars colonies, no, no singularity uploads, no life extinction. Like we're all in for the least of our brothers and sisters. I don't know how else to get us there other than people having that initiatory experience for themselves and having the freedom of choice, which is critical, right? The freedom to choose, I'm in for this. If somebody twigs on to ecstasis and catharsis, so peak states and deep healing, you invariably end up with a community growing around it. And way more often than not, those end up super problematic and end up in culty territory. And the challenge, right, is that, you know, and again, the, the original Latin for uh, derivation or, or root of cult is cultus. And one of the one of the definitions just means to worship. And you're like, okay, so as a comparative religious scholar, right, people you know, routinely talk about mystery cults. They talk about the cult of Dionysus, the cult of Kali, the Eleusinian cult. Christianity was a cult until Constantine rubber stamped it, right? So you're like, oh, that's just a community of practice around ecstasis and catharsis. And that required a subjugation of my, the self to a lineage of teachers. So there might have been a person up front, but they had teachers and before them and descendants, and this has been going on for centuries or thousands of years, and we sort of, it's all buffered and controlled. So I submit to the thing, but it's, it's, it's intergenerationally bounded. Then we got, in the mid 20th century, we got a lot of, <coughs> and then in the mid 20th century, we got, we got a lot of culty cults. We got this kind of weird hybridization of Eastern and Western technology. We had a bunch of rational individual Westerners gobsmacked and gooey eyed at Eastern ideas, non-dual teachings, and a lot of techniques and hierarchies that kind of came out of monastic traditions, a lot of guru student stuff, a lot of satsang sitting in front of awakened masters and that kind of thing. And a number of teachers, both Eastern transplants and then Western self-appointed ones who said, okay, we're going to keep that the kind of shell of medieval Eastern monasticism, but we're going to break with tradition. So these are new covenants, people. I'm the first and the best and the greatest, you know, and maybe I'm like Jesus and Buddha and Lao Tzu, or maybe I'm even better than them, but whatever it is, I don't have teachers and I don't answer to a steering committee. So now we had subjugation of self to a higher appointed God self with no buffering. And that became wildly problematic. And that's where we end up with everything from Manson to the Moonies to Nexium to Heaven's Gate. We ended up with those highly dysfunctional situations. And then the question is, is how do we, how do we introduce, how do we socialize, how do we experiment with ethical cults, right? Which would be the idea of how do you, in fact, not subjugate the self to anybody anymore? It just doesn't fit our contemporary sensibilities, our sense of developmental psychology, what's healthy. So let's not do that anymore. But how, does, how do we increase the sovereignty of an individual while at the same time still allowing for the magic of co-creative coherence, of communitas, of where the sum is absolutely greater than the parts. It's more resilient, it's more hopeful, it's more resourceful, it's more creative, it's more courageous. Can we do that? And so that would be the introduction of kind of, you know, what is the ethical culture toolkit? How do we do that? And it basically is sort of, you know, and again, you can slice these a thousand ways, you have to collapse it somewhere. So I just kind of picked the five that seem, you know, sort of non-negotiable, like they sort of, it's, it's helpful to have them in your design build, which would be, you know, we kind of, we need metaphysics. We need some way of making sense of the ineffable. If we're going to have peak states, we have to have some form of operating system to unpack them. 
because otherwise what happens, and we're seeing this everywhere, right? We're seeing this in the entire New Age community, the transformational festival community. We're seeing this even in the psychedelic renaissance and clinical care around psychedelic therapies. And our colleague, Matt Johnson at Johns Hopkins has just written a really good piece on this saying, hey, I think there's actually some super duper problems in a lot of clinicians smuggling in their kind of mishmash cosmologies and imprinting them onto patients who are actually coming in for medical clinical treatment. And then they're suddenly ending up with these like new age viruses in their meaning making codes. So you're like, okay, so we need tight and clean metaphysics. We also need an ethics. Because again, if people have these experiences of the sublime or whatever it is, they make up whatever they, you know, whatever occurs to them, however they kind of first glimpse it or see it and whatever, you know, tools or, or reference points they've got lying around, they're often just creating these Frankenstein cosmologies. And then, but we need ethics. Because if this is only about my sensation seeking, if this is only about novelty or even my own egoic inflation, then we end up either with drooling idiots or Sith Lords. You, you, it, doesn't, it doesn't go well. So, so having an ethics is sort of like the tail rotor on a helicopter. So it keeps us flying straight. Otherwise, we just spin in circles. And we are clearly, I think, beyond the place of binary morals. Like, again, not to beat on the Ten Commandments, but, you know, they were written thousands of years ago in very different times and places. And coveting my neighbor's ox is not a particularly good insight on what to do tomorrow. Right. And those were binary. They were rigid and fixed. And they were intended for the lowest common denominator of a society, right? So because ethics, which is no longer about either ors, it's about, well, it depends. And your relationship to the act determines the rightness of that act is far squishier. It's, it's a higher level operating system. But psychedelic experiences and Roland Griffiths at Hopkins said this as he recreated the uh, Good Friday experiment from Harvard back in 62. He said, he said I'm, you know, there's nothing like this in the, in the scientific literature of how those insights had to be, were, were so clear and then so repressed. <laughs> he said, there's something about the sort of ineffability of the mystical, in this case, psychedelically induced mystical experience that it defies and threatens existing authority structures. And so the technical term for that is antinomian which is, you know, the shorthand for that is just, you're not the boss of me, right? I've just seen the light, you know, fuck you, right? So the question is, is how do we have provisional ethics that can still guide people to, you know, in high integrity pro-social outcomes, right? Without succumbing to tops down monolithic command control, thou shalt, thou shalt not. And from there, you know, there's the sense, you know, this goes back to Cinderella stories and Vonnegut and even really the whole conversation we're having, which is we also need um, sacraments. We need a way for people to r repeat and renew and reaffirm the central ineffable experience that that community is based on. So, you know, if it seemed, you know, in, in Christianity, it's just a familiar example, right? You have Jesus does his thing, and then you get Pentecost and tongues of fire, so you get a handful of apostles who are apparently lit up. If you do a little bit more scholarly snooping around, you're like, oh, the first century Gnostics, they were mostly switched on too, right? And then it just kind of fizzles, right? And then you get tops down placebo sacraments, and you get the occasional mystic, Hildegard von Bingen, St. John of the Cross, St. Francis, you know, all the, you know, that, and they're always dodgy as anything, right? There's a question as whether they're going to be hailed as heroes and saints or burned at the stake. And as often as not, they're burned in the stakes and sainted afterwards. You know, like, whoops, sorry, now you're safely snuffed it. We will actually acknowledge you probably had something going on, right? So the, uh, so the, the, so voltage drop across lineages is persistent, right? It's that whole thing of like Christ made more Christians than Christ, Buddha made more Buddhists than Buddhas. Bruce Lee couldn't even pull it off. There's no, Bruce Lee didn't make another Bruce Lee. So how on earth do you, do we harness? I mean, this goes back to Yuval Harari and gossip and a culture, culture is basically, you know, intergenerational knowledge transfer. So how do we do that? I think one of the only ways to do it is to make sure that the signposts and footpaths to the wishing well remain weeded and uncluttered and that other people can go and see for themselves. So sacraments that provide Gnostic initiatory experience seem like they're probably an important piece of keeping traditions live and vibrant and progressive versus static and stagnant. 
and retrospective. And then, you know, um, this is the Vonnegut bit, right? We need stories. How, what is this? Where are we going? What does it mean? How, how do I deal with the highs and lows and question marks of my lived experience and our collective? And, you know, again, this is a potentially super problematic space because, of course, who decides which stories? And we can't even figure out what the fuck to teach an English class to high schoolers, right? It's a pitched knife fight in the culture wars, right? I mean, even though, I mean, funnily enough, Mathematics is apparently getting politicized these days as well, which is mind bending, but you know, for sure the humanities always do. You know, what history you teach and what literature you teach is wildly volatile because the sense is, is who controls those stories controls who we are and how we make sense of things. But there is again, back to decentralized, there is something beautiful about looking to what we've already got around us. And I think if there's a overarching theme, which is the hour is late and the stakes are high, but we've got everything we need already just lying in pieces around us. And if we can, if we can see what, you know, if we can value the treasure that is scattered through our culture and through history, and we can reassemble these things, we've got everything we need to pull this off. And, and one of the places, and this is just an example, um, one of the places that I find profoundly inspiring and helpful is you know, what, what we could call, it's basically the American songbook, right? Which, you know, to, to give it a, a label, you could almost call the arcana, the secret or hidden teachings of Americana, gospel, blues, folk, you know, soul, like all of these, all of these traditions that have come out of the American diaspora that have been forged in the crisis of the legacy of conquest of slavery and genocide and migration and all these cultures smashing and crashing into each other and articulating something beautifully post-tragic, right? Not, not stuck in the suffering and not necessarily just slinging kind of pre-tragic idealism, right? If, if pr the pre-tragic is everything's gonna work out and anyone can grow up to be president or an astronaut, and I'm gonna find my Sleeping Beauty or Prince Charming, right? Well, that lasts for a little while, but not that often. And many demagogues, by the way, reboot those. You know, they, they try and gin up a new fresh one for their tribe. But that isn't gonna do it for us. And most of us, and again, we see this with the alt-right, we see this with the far left, we're getting smashed into the tragic right now, which is nothing's gonna work out. And then that, that's diseases of despair, that's the factionalism, that's all the, the fibrillating rage and frustration we're feeling right now. But in that arcana Americana, right, in slave spirituals, in gospel, in blues, in folk, right, in these places is a post-tragic story, which is not that everything's going to work out or that nothing's that is going to work out. It's that I've been through the fire and that ultimately it's going to work out and I am testifying to it. And that, and I'm raising my voice and singing. And when we see that story through all of those traditions, which is typically, they, they, and they follow this beautiful, they, they follow that Cinderella story, right? Which is, which is, you know, things have sucked for me. <laughs> I've seen the light. I've had it ripped away from me. And here I am at the, in the pit of despair or grief or, or not knowing. And I stand up and I rise up singing. And, what, and, you know, and whether that's Beyonce and I'm a survivor, whether that's Lady Gaga and that star is born, right? Whether it's old timey Grateful Dead, whether it's, you know, whether, whether it's, you know, um, gospel and blues and, you know, and protest songs. We know those songs. Those are the ones we flick our lighters to these days. Sadly, we turn our fucking phones on instead of actually showing up for it. Right. But we know those songs and those become the anthems, right, of testimony to the human experience. And so that, that to me is, a, you know, a profound element of renewal. Cause like this shit doesn't pencil out. And there's many times we get the wind knocked out of us and we're flat on our backs. And it absolutely seems like there is no way forward. We've run all the traps. We're out of gas. We're done. And then, you know, then the beat shows up, you know, and then, and then the chorus and the refrain. And then we look around and we see other people on it. And we're like, well, maybe I could just, I didn't think I could, maybe I'll just get up, you know, maybe, oh, I hate, I can't help this. And like, holy shit, like here we are. And, you know, Robin Dunbar, uh, who's famously of the Dunbar number of 150 um, at Oxford, right? He did a study with the San Bushman uh, in the Kalahari. And he found that actually they, they engage in trance dances, 
So they'll, they'll drum, they'll dance, they'll, they will literally do exactly all the things we've talked about in the, the toolkit of the Alchemist cookbook. And they will dance and drum and play themselves into trance. And what was fascinating, he found that in fact, rather than that just being a celebration of the good times, they actually, the more sketched out and the more contentious and the tougher times were, the more often they had trance dances. So you're like, oh shit. So this is like a sort of, this is like a, a, a primeval groove and reconciliation committee. You know, it's like, it's batch forgiveness. And it's a way for us to kind of discharge our debts. And it's a way for us to reconnect uh, in a way that lets us go forward as a community with a little bit more resilience. And then finally, you know, the final bit of that toolkit is deities. Like, what do we do with this whole thing of, of deferring to or um, serving, loving, honoring something greater or bigger than ourselves? And, and again, you know, back to Hitchens and Harris and, and, and the new atheist, right? Their sense was um, superstitious sky gods are a relic of the past. They have been used as instruments of control, um, and they are front, you know, and their time has come and gone. And without a doubt, um, the priest class, you know, globally distributed in different garb and costumes and time periods, have without a doubt used their presumed or claimed access to be the mediators of the divine as social and political control, often with tyrannical and shitty outcomes. But the psychotechnology of contemplating something bigger than ourselves, some archetypal or idealized, um, I mean, in most cases, quite anthropomorphic, <laughs> you know, some, some better, bigger, badder ass version of us um, can have real power and possibility. But the final piece is just to kind of acknowledge, and this is another one of those snippets of viral code, similar to like, hey, rapture ideologies are potentially problematic, even though they feel really familiar to us is this idea specific to the Judeo-Christian tradition that God is all powerful and all good. So that the divine order is actually perfection and that anything that's not that, anything that's painful, anything that's random, anything that's harmful, hurtful, or scary must be from the forces of opposition. And Elaine Pagels uh, at Princeton, who did a lot of the work on the Nag Hammadi scrolls and the original Gnostic Gospels, um, also went deep into the Old Testament. And she found in the story of Job, this idea, you know, Job is the famous one who's like God's loyal servant. And Satan's like, ah, oh, yeah, you're full of shit, dude. He's only, he's only loyal because he's got a sweet life. Kick the shit out of him and see if he still believes in you. And then Yahweh proceeds to kick the shit out of Job, right? Bad, bad things happen to Job. And then Job shakes his fist at God and he you know, goes on this kind of existential rant. And then Satan's like, ha ha, see, I told you so, right? That, that whole story. But she found out actually something really interesting, which was that that, that was a, there was a, you know, there was multiple authors basically that this was kind of an accretion over time and that the story as I just told it and we sort of, you know, folks learned it in Sunday school was a late amalgam and that the first version didn't have Satan in it at all. It just had Yahweh and Job. And, you know, author number one was like, well, this barely makes sense. So author number two was like, ah, uh, that makes no sense. You cannot have God who's all good and all powerful. This is the Auschwitz problem, right? If, if, if God is all good, he never would have let the gas chambers happen. And if, and, and if he was, um, and if he was all powerful and, 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 and if, and if, and if he was good and it happened anyway, then he couldn't be all powerful. Some other force must have been able to supersede his will. And St. Augustine, David Hume, like, like Western philosophy and theology has done backflips trying to square that circle because it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And Pagels, um, she, as, as a person, she tragically lost her son to a congenital uh, birth defect at the age of like six or seven. And within a year, her husband, who was a famous physicist, um, died falling off a mountain in Aspen. So she lost her family in one year for no fucking good reason. And she was a scholar of Christianity and the Judeo-Christian tradition. She's like, okay, Jewish and Christian scholars talk about the problem of evil, like it's something that's an anomaly. But that's not the case anywhere else in the world traditions. You look at Greek mythology and all the gods are fickle and jealous and petty and kind and generous and creative, but they're human in their span. And you look at indigenous traditions and whether it's Iktome or Br'er Rabbit, you know, the tricksters. 
and the idea, you know, which Bugs Bunny is a descendant of, of, of that West African tradition, right? And the trickster can sometimes be the helper of human, humankind, and they can sometimes be the adversary, and they can bust your balls, and they can fuck with you, and they can do all sorts of things just depending on how they feel like it. And, and so that sense of the trickster element, if we're going to reinstantiate some form of uh, intentional post-conventional deity worship, right, for on our own terms, with our own understanding of the architecture and what we're doing, then reinstantiating the trickster that sometimes good things happen to bad people and sometimes bad things happen to good people and there's not always a master plan can become an essential part of maturing our understanding, again, of a complex metasystemic crisis where we don't necessarily get a happily ever after. And just to bring it to the present, right, that theological split of God is all good and is all powerful and anything else has to be the Satan plot device, because otherwise we can't, we can't pencil out this equation, that gives rise to new thought in the late 19th century. That gives rise to Norman Vincent Peale. That gives rise to the secret. That gives rise to QAnon, which is the world is supposed to be perfect and just and true, and anything that's not must be dark and sinister forces that are outside it. So by bringing back in the you know, almost the Bhagavad Gita element of like, we're damned if we do and we're damned if we don't, we're going to do our best anyway, because that's the only path forward. Feels like a really important part of maturing our, our cosmologies so that they are a closer fit. And I think um, there's a great book called Trickster Makes This World. And the, and the author says, he says, in that, he says, if we, if we neglect the trickster, we set ourselves up to, to experience more chaos and more cataclysm, right? Because we, it's almost like damming a river that normally floods and normally does its natural cleansing and, re, and rebuilding, but we dam it and we stop it. And that just means that the crisis that eventually comes is that much worse. So that would be the kind of the five elements, right? The metaphysics, how do we make sense of the ineffable? The ethics, how do we steer of what all we do, even if these experiences are fundamentally antinomian and anti-authority? Sacraments, how do we renew our own lived experience that is at the core of a community? Uh, scriptures, what stories do we look to to guide us? And deities, what do we what do we do to personify or instantiate a vision of the sublime? that actually includes as much of the wonky, messy, ineffable mystery of being alive as possible. I mean, I think for anybody who's kind of overwhelmed by all of the graphs showing all of the things going off a cliff in this unsolvable, multivariable equation, I do think that there's something critical for us to retain hope about, which is, which is that at our root, we're hardwired for courage. And our, our buddy, Andrew Huberman, a neuroscientist at Stanford, um, just published last autumn a paper in the journal Nature about his study of mice and their response to basically birds of prey looming over them. So like there's curtains for a little mousey, right? But they then stimulated a specific spot in the mice's brains. And it was, it's called the nucleus reunions, this tiny little area near the hypothalamus. And when they stimulated it, the mice, 98% normally run and hide. And then when they stimulated the nucleus reunions, the mouse turns around and thumps its tail and basically says, bring it. You know, it's like Bruce Lee, like check, 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 right? And very, you know, unusual for a mouse. And what was interesting is that the mice, when they were given an option uh, of food or sex, or to have that area of courage stimulated, right? They actually chose courage. And there are other studies that show that humans do too. And so back to soul force and back to being, you know, back to having the toolkit to self-initiate ourselves and the people we love into being twice born humans. Like I've, I've, I've experienced that moment, that crux, that moment of crisis, that moment of fight, flight, survival, death, rebirth, and I'm all in, that we are hardwired for courage at the deepest level of our being. And, on a, you know, poetic side note, it just is what it is, right? That, 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 that little spot in our brains, right? The nucleus reunions literally translates as the seed of our reunion, right? It's how we come together. 
is via our courage. So Jonathan Lear at the University of Chicago uh, wrote a book called Radical Hope. And his whole premise was, you know, he said, it, he said it's kind of the blind spot of every civilization, right, to, to not be able to conceive of its own demise. Right. And so, you know, we, we talk about the premise of this book, which is like, hey, we can reclaim our healing, inspiration and connection and we can do this with each other. And if we get it right, it's tricky. But if we get it right, we can even do it with communities and, and, and tribes and, and, and broadly. And I think the only honest outcome I could have to this book is we could do all of that. It's all hard. It's low odds. And it still might not be enough. Right. We actually still might not get to our cherished outcomes. We don't know. Right? The hour is late and the stakes are high and this is complicated. So the question is, is, is how can we, what can we hold on to that is, more, that is anti-fragile? What, what can we hold on to that can survive crushing disappointment? And, and his concept, which I think is beautiful, is the notion of radical hope. And radical hope is beyond, I'm hoping for the ship to right itself. Right? Radical hope is, is different than, I think, and we're the ones to save the day. Radical hope is, you know, it's Moses getting to the promised land. It's, 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 I don't know if this works out for me or for us in this lifetime, but we are going to commit to playing our part regardless in the irreducible conviction that ultimately it works out. And is that true? Is that the good news that we can share with confidence to everybody? And like, we, you know, we've seen the promised land. No. But it is like if, if we've disabused ourselves of a whole lot of superstitions and fictions and we have privileged individual sovereignty and choice making, if there is one helpful lie, if there is one story that serves, it could be that. And that was echoed by Admiral Jim Stockdale uh, in Vietnam, who, who you know, was famously the highest ranking POW in Vietnam. And he, you know, he had lots of attention and spotlight and pressure on him during his time of imprisonment. And he noticed something important. He's like, he said, um, the pessimists you know, didn't, didn't survive. No surprise there. Like we're doomed, we're stuffed, I'm gonna die. Yep, they died. But the interesting thing he noticed was that the optimists died as well. If the boys were gonna be home for Christmas or July the 4th, and then those dates came and went, then they gave up the ghost, right? They didn't have radical hope, they had provisional hope. And he said, the people that survived, and it was now, it's now you know, enshrined as the Stockdale paradox were those who had ruthless assessment of current realities, right? They called spades where they needed to, but they remained relentlessly optimistic about the long-term possibility. And if we can do that, right? If we can recapture our own rapture, like lowercase r, so our healing, our inspiration, and our connection, and we know how to kind of maintain that and reboot that as we go, then we have a chance to recapture our uppercase rapture, the, the grand story, the greatest story ever told of how this all goes down. And we see this in our stories. I mean, back to Vonnegut and the shape of stories, right? We see this in our stories. We see this in, you know, It's a Wonderful Life with Jimmy Stewart, you know, wants to snuff himself off the bridge and then realizes, oh shit, you know, like I've actually had positive impact. I choose this. I'm dancing through the snow. Ebenezer Scrooge, you know, happy Christmas to each and every one. Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz, right? She's like, I hate this fucking ranch in Kansas. Get me out of Dodge. Does her wonderful magical mystery tour, comes back and there's no place like home. And that experience can sound like a platitude, Right. But I think, you know, in our stories, we've actually been kind of nudging at this thing. And it's, you know, it's back to Plato and it's back to Goethe. So it's got, it's got pedigree, right? Which is we are fuck all useless and don't want to be here and are coming in at quarter strength, you know, unless or until we show up to truly take our stand and to opt in. And then, and then something beautiful happens. We cease to be escaping. We cease to be bypassing. Rapture ideologies are actually, you know, turned to ash in our mouth. And we actually turn to show up. And I think this is the key for us to not simply talk about it or say, hey, guys, we really all got to get along. It's like this is the key to unlocking soul force. This is the key. You know, and again, we fetishize these moments. If you think about that film 300, you know, with Gerard Butler, right? Leonidas, you know, like if they're shooting all the arrows, then today we will fight in the shade. And everyone's like, oh, that's so baller. You know, like, I'd love to be that guy, you know, or it's, or it's Dead Poet Society and the stamping up on the desks and the, oh, captain, my captain, or it's Thelma and Louise, you know, being like, fuck this, we're not going to prison. You know, we're going to send it, no skid marks, 
right? Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Like we love those moments where a person with their back against the wall says, I am going to not make the choice to seek pleasure and avoid pain, right? I'm beyond my animal imprinting and I am going to do something for the ages, right? I am going to take a stand for something bigger and beyond myself. And it kind of feels that that's sort of where we are. <laughs> and, and if we can help, you know, get to that three and a half percent, get to that whatever percent of people who are willing to do that, um, we maybe have a shot. Because to point to your, you know, your, your earlier question, which I feel like I only half answered, which was um, the collapse in authority, the collapse in leaders, right? And who can we index off? Who, who, can, who can sort of ring that bell that reminds us of the better angels of our nature at a time when there's massive leveling tendencies? You know, if you think of Occupy Wall Street, the, the fact that this was this flat and decentralized leaderless organization meant that it actually just kind of collapsed under its own inertia. The same with Black Lives Matter movements in Portland and Seattle and some other places. They sort of, they succumbed quite quickly, so like sadly quickly, um, into infighting and sort of internecine p political battles versus very big ever-present threats. And, you know, contrast that with the Mandelas, the Gandhis, and the Kings, right? You, we, you act, we actually do need exceptional humans. We do need people to remind us of the better angels of our nature because the tendency for retributive tribalism is so powerful that it's critical that someone is holding the higher tone. And, you know, and, uh, and I, you know that phrase, like, it takes a field to hold a field. Somebody's got to stitch together those possibilities. And I think that this is kind of a meet in the middle. You know, rather than waiting for the great men or great women of history to sort of arrive and lead us, which generally, I mean, it's definitely sent ripples, but it doesn't seem super scalable and it might just, you know, we just might not have a taste for it. What if we can help people self-initiate into being a twice-born human, being fully committed, and then modeling that within their communities? and hope that that ripple effect can kind of create a sustainable movement.